my talk is going to be about 20 minutes. It's going to have two parts um, in the form of a story because uh, uh, we like stories. So if that would be more interesting. The first part is going to be about um, how this uh, film was made. And the second part um, is going to be about Blair Fairchild, um, I guess through my eyes. <clears throat> and then we'll see what happens next. So um, first part, I'm a um, uh, uh, full-time Iranian musician and I'm pretty active in the field of music uh, in the Bay Area. And um, for the past 20 years or so, <clears throat> I have tried to drown myself in different, as if I wasn't drowned already in arts, I drowned myself in uh, different uh, music of different cultures uh, from Ghana to uh, South Philippines, Japanese, Indian, jazz, hip hop, uh, classical Western music. And then in the last um, <clears throat> two years, I've been studying music of Afghanistan, and I hope I can continue. Um, so while doing that work, I was searching online for some scores, and uh, in the middle of nowhere, I found this book. And I go, what is this? And so um, I called my friend. Um, I, said I, I said I should do something with this uh, book and score. If I didn't know about it, probably some of my students or my friends don't know about it as well. So I should uh, do something with this. So. I called Gulnaz Khazai, uh, <clears throat> who's a uh, great musician from Huntsville, Alabama. Um, um, amazing musician. We have worked uh, together on many different projects. And uh, um, we recently released an album, uh, Baro. And um, so I called her and I said, uh, hey, Gulnaz, uh, I found this score. Do you want to jump in? And he and she agreed. And um, so then after that, I called um, Reza Ahmadi, who's a pianist, uh, but he's an engineer, uh, but a pianist, a very good pianist in Bay Area. And I called him and I said, <clears throat> Reza, I found this score. And then as soon as I said this, you know, uh, he's like, I know which one you're talking about. So he knew about this score uh, some years back and wanted to do something with it. Uh, but I guess it didn't work out. <clears throat> and after that, I said, you know, I would like to, uh, uh, I think I should publish this work. Um, um, not through uh, social media, but something more serious and academic. Uh, and so the only person that came to my mind was uh, dear Dr. Uh, Abbas Milani. And uh, as you heard, I uh, um, <clears throat> have worked uh, for the Iranian studies before, composed music for Ustad Bahram Beyzai. So I called uh, Dr. Milani and we had a meeting um, and the meeting went great. One of the greatest meetings um, I have ever had. And uh, what happened after is that Gulnaz came all the way from uh, Huntsville, Alabama, to um, Bay Area, and we went to Central State to record this <coughs> film. And um, Vahid Zamoni uh, did the videography, he filmed us. And uh, Sadiq Ahmed uh, was our sound uh, designer. Uh, so we go, we went into the, we went to Central Stage and um, in this black box, and um, we recorded the entire thing. It took us with preparation about four hours maybe, but the recording took uh, seems like about one hour and a half or two hours. And I should say that this is a very hard job. Um, <clears throat> especially for a singer. Imagine singing um, 12 songs in two different versions 
uh, one Western uh, taste and one uh, Iranian uh, under two hours, that would be 24 songs. And uh, it's a very hard thing to do. So I really thank uh, Gomez, that was great. <clears throat> Then I recorded the work, edited, and sent it to Iranian studies. Um, and lots of emails back and forth uh, with Roma and Franco. Thank you very much. I also apologize for all the trouble, uh, trouble I gave you. Then also I should thank uh, <clears throat> Amin Hossein, who did the subtitles, and Nilofar as well. So thank you all. So now we are here. We have the movie. and. Uh, why is this important? In, uh, it's important for many reasons, but one of the most interesting reasons is that an American um, goes to Iran for diplomatic reasons 120 years ago, and <clears throat> but he comes out with music. Um, now, who's Blair Fairchild? This is, this is the second part. Blair Fairchild um, is born, was born in 1877 in Massachusetts. Uh, he is born into a family of uh, diplomats and politicians. He's surrounded uh, with these politicians. In fact, his um, grandfather, um, his grandfather is a first mayor of um, Madison, Wisconsin. And um, then he is sent, or he goes, I don't know, he goes to Middle East for, um, for diplomatic reasons. <clears throat> Uh, based on my last research, uh, seems like he goes to uh, Constantinople, the Ottoman capital, I guess, um, in 1901. These are new information I have found out. And um, then he goes to Tehran. He publishes this book in 1904. So by that time, he's 27 years old. So he's in Tehran when he's 25 years old or 24 years old, roughly. And it seems like um, he's really enjoying his time based on what he writes in his book. <clears throat> now we have to understand 1904, is uh, three three years after uh, 1904, um, Muzaffar Din Shah passes away, and Muzaffar Din Shah ruled for eleven years, so he was there during that time, and seems like he's really enjoying his time based on again what he writes in his book. Now, if I may ask uh, Franco, please, uh, if you could. Um, uh, show the beginning of uh, this movie where he talks about his experience in Iran. I should also say that uh, uh, <clears throat> Blair Fairchild dedicates uh, this book to his mother. And so we have dedicated this film to our mothers. Uh, let's watch a short clip. To my mother, I am only too sensible how little the following folk songs retain of their original interest and charm in being sung with so western an instrument as the piano. The melodies themselves were written down as faithfully as possible, just as they were sung to me in Persia, and in the accompaniment I have sought to avoid entirely our Western harmonies, of which the East knows nothing. The sounds of curious Persian violin, the nasal reed and drum, or the more mellow Eastern guitar, 
cannot be reproduced in the least, of course. Yet I have tried. I fear with but very slender success to give some suggestion of the rhythm and characteristic combinations of sound that are so striking in the originals. But one needs the setting of the Orient to realize what these songs are. The warm, clear Persian night, the lamps and lanterns shining on the glowing colors of native dresses, the surrounding darkness where dusky shadows hover, the strange sounds of music, voices, sometimes so beautiful, rising and falling in persistent monotony. All this is untranslatable, but the impression left on one is so vivid and so full of enchantment that one longs to preserve it in some form. Blair Fairchild Paris, 1904. So, um, Blair Fairchild is associated uh, with the Indianist uh, musicians. And, and uh, this is a style of music where um, Western, uh, where American classical musicians uh, in uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, um, um, late 19th century, early 20th century, wanted to combine um, Native American um, uh, musical elements with Western classical uh, elements to, in order to uh, create um, an American national music. So he understands preservation. And um, he goes to Iran with this tool. Now, by tool, I mean the art and technique of uh, writing uh, Western music. This tool um, had been evolved for, for centuries with what it had to produce, that was music. Uh, so music and the technique of writing the music evolved together. So he goes to Iran with this tool and he tries to um, measure or uh, record and write down a musical style that was very different. Uh, in doing so, you're going to uh, have some distortion. You're going to lose some of the original materials. And he also agrees in the beginning of his book, but he tried his best. Uh, now, what we are doing in the film is that Reza and Golnaz are playing what he wrote uh, in the book as written. What I am doing is I'm playing a role of a person that says, okay, let me see. What if I try to get rid of this distortion? And this is all subjective. Um, and so I have to make some changes. For example, I change the beat, I change the uh, rhythm, time signature, or I might just, you know, um, I might just study it and say, huh, maybe this was in a different mode. He was trying to write it in this mode. And so I have to make some adjustments in order to play it maybe and only maybe um, so I can hear what this music could have sounded like back then. And again, that part is only subjective. Uh, but Reza and Golnaz are playing and trying to play exactly what is written um, in the book. Now, <clears throat> I'm done with my two parts, but I would like to add, um, two important points about uh, this book. One is that there are two pieces in this book that we play today. Khaham Kebar Zulfat in Dashti. Khaham Kebar Zulfat, that one. 
and it's a very famous piece we know today. And then the other one, uh, which is less famous, but we still play it, uh, called Delvare. It's in the mode of Chargo, uh, Dastgo of Chargo. And Delvare Siminozor. So that so it's so in this book we can actually see the DNA or the early versions of these two songs. The rest I ha uh, haven't uh, found anything about them. The last piece is also very interesting because uh, it's a, it's the first time um, that you see a musical score about Iranian music. Uh, in many levels, this is only the first time that his uh, Blair Fairchild is writing uh, the piece Shah Dar Shekares in a five beat pattern. One, two, one, two, three. And <clears throat> the, next two the next point I wanna make is that we have to understand why this is very important because at that time, of course, uh, the French, um, uh, Lumer was in the courts of Nasser Din Shah and writing, um, you know, working on music. And uh, there are some scores uh, from him that he's only getting, I think, inspired in order to make music. And during that time, there are Western musicians, mainly Europeans, who are getting inspired to compose music. <clears throat> but Blair Fairchild is trying to preserve with the only tool that he has. So this is valuable. And um, <clears throat> we Iranians um, were not using musical uh, notation at that time. We adapted this uh, musical notation. Of course, you've had uh, throughout uh, hundreds of years, um, um, we have tried to write down music um, in different formats using abjad, alphabet, um, and numbers, um, but we adapted this style of writing music um, about 100 years ago, and we were not good at it. And at that time, um, there was no a news, a Western music notation of um, trying to preserve Iranian music. And I think this is the first one done by an American uh, dip diplomat and a musician. And so we can talk about this interesting uh, finding uh, more and more. So I'm gonna stop here and um, if you have any questions or anything, I'll be, I'll, I'm glad to uh, answer. And Gulnaz is here with us again. Thank you for joining. And if you have any questions you can ask her, I believe she can uh, respond back here. So back to you, Roma and someone else. Thank you so much, Faraz. That was very interesting. Thank you for sharing your additional thoughts. Um, uh, to the audience, anytime you'd like to submit questions, please use the Q&A button. Um, Golnaz, I'm wondering if we can invite you on to say a few words about your experience, both with the film and with the music. Good morning, everybody. And uh, I wanna say thank you to uh, Mr. Hamid and Christina Mugadam from programming Iranian study at, at Stanford. Also, thank you so much for inviting me and giving me opportunity to talk about that um, beautiful um, story about Blair Fairchild. And uh, I'm honored to be with you today. Thank you, Balnaz. So a few questions, um, Faraz, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Do you know how the book or this music was received in the West? I know he, he wrote this book and he dedicates it to his mother, but do we have any information about, you know, if, if other people in the West were reading it and what they thought of it? Mm, not yet. Mm. <laughs> I um, researched a lot. Actually, when Faraz told me that he found a, a 12 Persian songs wrote with the American composer, I mean, amb ambassador, uh, I was shocked. And I said, are you sure about that? He said, yes. I mean, and then we uh, talked ab about it a lot. And um, he said, would you like to 
try and see what's going on in here. What was his uh, feeling about the, you know, uh, Persian songs? And then we uh, try to practice, I mean, not practice, talking about all the songs and the books. And uh, like Farah said, I um, saw that I was during um, Moza Faradin Shah period time. And uh, I was thinking, um, I was trying to uh, go to the past, you know, to feel the atmosphere in possibly in Tehran because he was an ambassador. I, I think possibly he was in uh, Tehran and uh, feeling that time and uh, um, thinking uh, why he decided to write 12 uh, Persian songs. And the most important part for me to give it to his mother as a gift. This is very interesting for me. Um, but the most important part for me, except the music and his uh, feeling and thought is um, to see we didn't have any boundary, you know, no boundary and no border. Just the American guy as an ambassador was in Tehran, sitting in Tehran, talking to the Iranian people, sing, uh, listening to the Persian songs, Iranian songs, and something just came to his heart and his soul. This is very important for me. Uh, without po policy and benefit, he just felt something. He saw the beauty of songs. He felt the atmosphere, people, and music. And then he came back and decided to write 12 Persian songs. And uh, you must have a very powerful goal to do this. And I think the powerful goal was his pure feeling. And then, um, very interesting for me to, as I said, to uh, give it to his mother as a gift. Thank you so much, Golnaz. But I don't know if you want to add a few thoughts or we can move on to another question. Back to your question. No, I don't. Um, I don't know how it was uh, received. Uh, the, the notes are, the scores are written down. Um, he, he tries to uh, write down what he hears. And so he's not adding a lot of, you know, as he says, any harmonies or any complex stuff. So um, it's a simple song, but I'm sure if um, <laughs> during that time, if you want to play this, then you probably ask yourself, ah, oh, this is not sounding what I'm trying, what I'm used to, you know, what I, so you might not uh, do anything with it. Um, so, but I uh, know, I don't know, I don't know. Thank you. Um, one viewer asked, how hard is it, or how hard was it to translate from a Western scale back to an Iranian one? Did you say scale? Yeah. It's uh, actually, <laughs> it's not hard or easy, but it's interesting because for each of these songs, I had to use different techniques in order to um, change them a little bit. Um, for example, in Khaham Kebar Zulfat, I just knew that this is in Dashti. But what he's writing down, the time signature and the key, si oh, sorry, not the time signature, but the key signature he has in there, it's not in Dashti and the sound is off. So I'm like, I'm going to guess this one's in Dashti because today we sing it in Dashti. Or the same thing happened to Delbare, with, with, which is in Charga. But in some of the other ones, um, I could see where he's trying, where the distortion is. And um, I could, I would, what I would do is I would say, all right, I could see this, uh, the shape of the melodies, uh, how these melodies go up and down. And I would just guess I'm, I, that it's probably this daska because that's how we move around in this daska. Um, so I would try it in, a, in this daska, then it wouldn't work. Then I would change it to something else. Um, 
And so in almost in each piece, I try to use a different technique to sort of turn them back to some and give it some uh, Iranian flavor. Um, yeah, I hope I answered the question. <laughs> Thank you. And what would you say were the most challenging and most rewarding parts about this project? The most challenging was the technical, you know, the editing materials and um, uh, the emails and uh, all that is very tech. It's, nowadays, I guess, um, that was a little uh, hard. Um, and But um, the hard and what else did you say? It was a good one. The most challenging and the most rewarding. Rewarding. The most rewarding is when I'm sitting down by myself alone in my practice room and uh, traveling through time and, play, and playing this music um, and trying to feel history. Uh, that was the most rewarding for me. Um, and it happened before, the, before, recording the, <laughs> uh, before recording the entire thing. That was that was very important. That was a gift of him allowing me to play something and and try to feel him and try to feel the history and just be with myself and taste uh, beauty and history all together. Thank you. Um, Golnaz, maybe on the vocal side, what was challenging or rewarding for you? Um, so. You know, singing all 12 songs um, by yourself <laughs> and uh, trying to be exact like he wrote the song and notes, it was a little bit difficult um, to be tuned and write as he wrote the songs. Uh, we decided not adding any our opinion and our taste to the music. Uh, and uh, just make it pure as he wrote the songs. And uh, hopefully in future, the musician or maybe three of us again are going to, you know, think about it uh, to uh, add our uh, opinion and music technique to see what's going on. But the, uh, just singing exact the notes, tune it was it was a little bit hard <laughs> thank you um, for thank us, there's you. a there's a part in the video okay okay but, but he says he you says specifically music. need the setting of the orient to fully experience the music is this uh, a bit orientalist perhaps can you say more about what you think he meant by that setting of the orient Um, the, such a good question. Uh, so I don't want to get into the topic of um, Orientalism and Occidentalism and all that. Um, it was a language that he, uh, he uh, was used to. And um, he had a tool that he was used to. But um, so he goes, and then, and then he goes to Iran and he's like, this is beautiful and I'm gonna write it down. Um, but I totally understand that in order to fully um, feel uh, the artwork, the closer you get to the source of the artwork, the more details and connections you're gonna find out. Uh, of course, listening uh, to music, uh, I think I myself personally think through these new uh, devices is not the fully uh, experience, uh, the full experience. And so also the same way, if, if you go, if you go you know, sit by a musician and they play right in front of you, you're going to experience something totally different. He doesn't only, so he travels all the way and he goes there and he's uh, seems like he's having a fun time and amazed with this atmosphere. And then, you know, if you can picture of that, if you can picture that scene 
the dresses and people going and coming and something totally different. And some, suddenly you have this music you hear that is totally foreign, but beautiful. It has harmony, it has melody. Harmony, not in the sense of Western classical harmony, in a different setting. So he has, he experiences this, um, this uh, music um, and uh, he's amazed with it. So I think this is what he's trying to say that you, you, know, you know, he's basically saying, man, you should come here and listen to this music. But the language he's using might have, you know, some um, overtones. Thank you. Um, another viewer asked a technical question. Has there been any formal studies on mapping songs from the Iranian scale, such as Sega, Chaharga, Afshari, to the 12 note Western standard in an optimal way and without losing too much flavor? If not, would it be worth exploring this field a little more and developing formulas or guidelines for Western musicians? I would like to ask you to ask this question because I don't want to miss the points. One more time, a bit slower. Sure, no problem. Thank so you. I'll ask it in two parts. So the first part, they ask, has there been any formal studies on mapping songs from the Iranian scales to the 12 note Western standard in an optimal way and without losing too much flavor? So translating kind of the Iranian scales to the Western standard. Yeah. It's it's a question that uh, over you know it has so many uh, things that we can talk about, but I can't say yes or no. But there has been a lot of researches on uh, on, on the music of Iran and com comparing contrasting uh, these scales to Western music. A lot of researches, but um, but you know don't want to generalize. Uh, my answers, um, and I don't I know the background of the person who asked you actually asked this question, but um, um, perhaps the the second part of the question they ask, um, if not, would it be worth exploring this field a little bit more and kind of developing formal guidelines for Western musicians? So maybe if you want to say a few words about uh, what kind of absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. The more research we can have. Uh, of course, of course. I mean, uh, <laughs> please, yes. Uh, what I would have to say, we're not, you know, uh, I as an immigrant uh, <laughs> I was pretty alone in the field of music as an Iranian. Um, I never had, no, I didn't have friends uh, in my school. I never had friends. And all my friends were in the engineering department. <laughs> and so, um, it was a it was a lonely place, um, but of course there are uh, great uh, musicians, Hafez Mudirzadeh, or Hassan Abedini, or you know, uh, there are a lot of people uh, um, uh, whose names uh, I'm, I can't. Uh, it's not coming to my mind right now. But there are a lot of I mean Hossein Pujabadi, um, who actually went to this field professionally and they studied music. And so there's a, a lot of stuff going on, but it's not a lot. It's a handful of uh, people who actually are active in this field. But um, yeah, I mean, more research, of course. And then you talk, and you're dealing with the kind of music, and I should really mention this, you're dealing with the music that has at least 5,000 years old, 5,000 years history. Uh, we have the tablets of ensembles playing harp, um, uh, some sort of flute, percussions, and a singer going back to, to 5,000 years ago. So, of course, they didn't just, you know, it came out of nowhere. They said, oh, let's actually uh, have an ensemble. It, it's evolved. So maybe 7,000 years. So we're dealing with the kind of music and culture that is layered, that has layers and layers and layers of ideas, topics, music styles, genres, and and of course, more research is always needed. Thank you. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the songs specifically. One viewer asks, are these songs still popular and kind of known and popular in Iran in their original version? Um, and maybe if you wanna say a few more words about the song specifically, maybe for the non-Iranian speaking audience, if you wanna translate a few of the titles or mention, you know, the, there were two songs you mentioned that are still played in Iran, if you wanna say a few more words about those. 
Yeah, as, as I said, there are two of them that we play today, Khoham Kebar Zulfat, which is pretty hard for me to translate. I want your hair and something. And Del Bare, oh my beloved. Shah Dar Shikarast, which is in a five beat pattern. Very interesting. This one is, this means Shah Dar Shikarast means a king is going hunting, but it has double meaning. And um, so Khaham Kibar Zulfat and Del we know today, but the others I couldn't find, and I would probably would be uh, thankful if someone somewhere could find uh, some information about these pieces. Um, the some of these songs are, you know, I talked to many of, of my friends and also Gulnaz. Uh, seems like he, you know, some people say it seems like he heard it in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle, you know, in, in the streets and bars and maybe clubs back then. Um, uh, yeah, some like uh, you want beats, and that's the name of the piece, by the way. You want beats. Um, um, my friend uh, said that some of one of my friends said that labu or beat was actually expensive back then, so the lovers would actually give each other some labu. Um, so the name of the song is uh, Labu, Do You Want Beats? And so <clears throat> it's, you know, it's like a very simple song that you can just sing, you know, walk around and sing for yourself. But some of the other pieces are actually pretty hard. And I would say, you know, um, quote unquote, pretty classical. <laughs> um, uh, it's actually a very hard piece to play or Again, Del Barre was it's the same thing. Mojdebe Bulbul Dahid is very interesting. Be Yek Negahi Marhamat. These are very interesting songs that I, I'm not sure if this was actually sang in a club or a bar or in, in Um And Shah Dar Shekharas is actually, <laughs> has a, a political connotations in there. Um, so I think it, in the matter of a year or so, maybe if it was in Iran, from 1901 to 1903, he tried to collect some of the good, you know, the different tastes and different modes, different musical modes. Um, Do you have a favorite song of the 12 songs? No, I love all of them. <laughs> I can't say which one I like. It's a very hard question to ask. Um, I, yeah, very hard. <laughs> And do you know if there have been efforts to record and catalog folk music generally in Iran? One viewer is asking. Oh, yes. Oh, there, there, there are extensive works, there are uh, uh, great projects. Yeah, the books and, and, and albums and uh, um, yes, a lot of information can be found. Um, not only a lot of information can be found about the folk um, music of Iran, which is very diverse, I should say, very, very, very diverse, because the music of Sistan, Baluchistan is totally different from music of the uh, Kurdistan. The music of Kurdistan is very different from the southern, south, uh, Bandar Abbas and Boucher. That music, I think, is very different from the music of the Bakhshis in north, uh, uh, east, and the uh, music of the Azerbaijan is very different from the north. And so you, you're dealing with, and they have musical, different musical traditions. Sometimes you would have a note in this, uh, in this village that does not exist in another village. And there were, so you're dealing with, again, thousands of years of, the remnants of thousands of years of history in each part of this um, country. Now I forgot what I was going to, what I was trying to say, but <laughs> I got carried away. Um, so maybe going back to you know translating Persian and um, music into the West, one viewer asked, listening to both of your comments, one thinks of Khayyam and the way Fitzgerald translated his work. He did not know Persian and approximated the poems. Would you agree? Perhaps is this a similar approximation? No, I think he's he's translating. He thanks Alma Shreddle for translating the lyrics. And I think uh, it's very amazing to me how they do it back then. Uh, someone has to help me out here. Um, 
but how he takes this knowledge out of the country, there's no recording uh, devices. So how he takes this word by word, he takes it out and Alma Stradle seems like helps him to translate. And it's a pretty good translation. It's a very good translation. Um, and he, he has this phonetics, this, what do you call them phonetics? Yeah, I think so. Uh, he's uh, here, I could show, maybe I can show him here, but he's uh, saying how you should actually pronounce this uh, alf, he, what he's writing here. So he's writing down, um, you know, this is a, he's um, telling us if, if there's a U, it should pronounce a double O. If it's an I with a little line on top, it should, it should be double E. And so, like, and then he gives an examples so like him, ham, lit, tall, and it's a very interesting word. Yeah. Thank you. A uh, question for Golnaz: How similar or different were the lyrics from music you are used to singing? Uh, can you just repeat it one more time? Sure. sure. A viewer is asking: How similar or different were the lyrics? from this music to the music that you're used to singing? Um, in this book, he showed each letters, letter with uh, complete with the, uh, the, the note that he wants to show. For example, if he wants to say mi ha he, uh, exactly you can see mi is one note, Ha is one note, he is one note. So clearly you could follow and continue his role to finish the song and sing the song. But uh, now if you want to, for example, um, compose uh, a tasni for something, it depends to the composer and the singer and their opinion and their taste to figure out what they want to do and uh, which way is better to make this tasnif better. But uh, for Blair Fairchild, you didn't have any problem to follow the rules or um, um, put the letters under the note. Uh, you could see clearly, he did a great job to show you um, all of them very clean. Thank you. And did you have a favorite song from the collection? Well, I, I love all of them because um, they are so beautiful and pure. But Bayek Negah Marhamat could be one of my favorite one. <laughs> I really want in future maybe I'm gonna do something with that Bayek Negah Marhamat. Sometimes. I'm singing when I'm working at home or um, I'm by myself, you know, sometimes I'm singing it. it. It came to my mind. I mean, so I really like it. <laughs> Thank you. And it's uh, song number the 11. It's 11. Song number, yeah. Thank you. Uh, maybe for both of you, Faraz, if you want to start, what are your hopes for this project now that the video has been completed and published? What do you hope you know viewers will get out of it watching it? What do you hope comes next for the book, for the music? <laughs> it's a good question. Let me let me think of it before I answer. Um, <clears throat> what do I hope? I, I'm, I believe um, um, as an artist, I um, should and must and should um, understand history uh, to frame what I do more clearly. And um, my hope, I guess, the only hope I guess would be um, people becoming more interested in the facts uh, of history 
And so by watching this, um, one could feel like connected to uh, the history and study more in order to make, um, to get connected to their roots and history. And uh, so, so they can, uh, I can, and everyone else can make better decisions. Um, we learn from history. And um, so I think that would be the only thing, for example, one person can see this and they go, oh, let me see 120 years ago. Who was ruling Iran 120 years ago? And what was happening back then? And what happened then he went, you know, Muzaffar and Shah, you know, did he die or was he killed or? And for me, myself as an artist um, studying history, not just as a, as a just a little hobby, but actually in very detail, inhaling history and my past would actually give me a better understanding of why I'm here today. So I think that would be the only hope that I think I might have for a friend who watches this movie. But going back to yeah, one of the, one, I wanna read something here for, about uh, the person who asked about translating. Just one sentence. It says the etch is always distinctly sounded except when at the end of the war, dot. The R is a slightly rolled. So he has this, <laughs> Amazing details in there. And um, just sorry, I went back to the previous question, but I think I wanted to read this little information. And by the way, the book, if you type the if you type the um, the title of this book, um, which is uh, 12 Persian folk songs, and uh, write down his uh, name, Blair Fairchild, I believe now you can find it online. Um, and uh, have fun with the book, I guess. Thank you, Braz. I believe Franco is going to share a link to the book in the chat. Um, I wanted to mention for those uh, viewers who are interested in Iranian, you know, musical history, I'm sharing a link in the chat to an event we hosted a couple years ago with a master musician, Mohammad Reza Darvishi, and there's, there's a really interesting talk where he goes into the history and uh, roots of Iranian music. Um, so just kind of uh, for those who want to learn a little bit more about it. Um, Golnaz, do you have any notes you want to add about kind of your your hopes or interest in, in the music and the book and the future of this project? Uh, as Faro said, um, uh, I really believe we have to study more about our history and past. Uh, to me, um, Persian music is like a, a rainbow with a different colors colors. And each color has the uh, different meaning and very important. So when you study history and know folklore music and the people in North, uh, South, West, East, you can get a lot of, you know, idea, colors and uh, work more in uh, new um, Persian music. And for these uh, 12 songs, it's a very, big opportunity for all musicians to study more even us um to just you know um, um return it to the uh, like a uh, iranian scales or have a concert and show it to more people and more audience and um, that's it <laughs> Um, but maybe they can be also played in their um, original, like how they're written, because this is beautiful too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you. Maybe um, to go back to one technical question a viewer submitted, they write, one of the challenges Blair probably faced in trying to recreate the music in the Western scale is the non-existence of some of the notes in the Iranian scale, especially the quarter notes. Did you have to make an educated guess that, to the translation and then you know, back to the Iranian scale, if you want to say a few more words about that? I guess um, that was a comment, right? I, I think they're asking if yeah. you had to kind of make an, an educated guess about this translation since the systems aren't equal. Of course, of course. Um, um, the, um, when he goes there, um, uh, I believe you have five minutes, right? Okay, so when he goes there, um, I am right now uh, in, in the middle of a project of transcribing some music. And it's very hard, very hard 
in the 21st century to exactly understand what's going on in the music that I, that no one is familiar with and then write it down. Um, so you don't lose the actual meaning of them, you know, simplified. You have to say that I'm simplifying this and you have to be in that setting in order to experience it fully, but it's very hard to actually write it down. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling what Blair was going through. And, but yes, I had to some take at some, um, you know, and guesses in order to uh, sort of change them a little bit uh, and sound them a little bit more uh, familiar. Yes. Um, all and you know we don't have much time, but I'll but uh, I also I would really like I really thank uh, the Iran studies and Roman Franklin and any, everyone else for uh, lighting um, a candle in my heart and. Um, giving us the opportunity to um, and helping us to uh, work on this music and uh, shed more light on um, uh, these beautiful concepts and projects. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faraz. And for all of the viewers, the, the video does live on our YouTube channel, so you can find it uh, in the Stanford Iranian Studies Program's YouTube channel. It will be up there um, forever. So um, no rush if you haven't seen it yet. We encourage you to go watch it. This conversation is being recorded, so you can come back and watch the conversation with Faraz and Golnaz. Um, we have just about a few minutes left. Left. I just wanted to ask, you know, did this project overall teach you anything you didn't know already about Persian music or about Western music, kind of in this project of comparing them? Did you discover something new about either tradition? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, what did I learn? Uh, uh, I didn't know. Did I know? I guess I learned a lot because I don't know what I learned, but I think I learned. I, I, I know what I'm learning. I feel it, but I don't know what I'm learning. So maybe one year from now I can say, oh, that's what I learned. That sounds good. Gonaz, any last thoughts? I mean, uh, I learned more about Fairchild. I mean, his personality. not and. Of course, I enjoyed 12 Persian songs. I had a very good time with Feroz and uh, Reza to just, you know, sing in and we had a very nice time together. But I really learned about him, how honest, you know, just um, writing 12 Persian so songs. Can you imagine me? I'm an ambassador in China. But, and then I'm going there and listening to the Chinese music and something is moving my heart. And then I'm going back, I'm down with China, you know. And then, but I'm trying to uh, write this Chinese songs and give it to my mother. This is very beautiful for me, it's very pure. And he was very nice and honest. Mm -hmm. So I learned about, uh, a lot from Fairchild. <laughs> well, thank you both. We're just about out of time. Thank you for us for making the film and sharing the music mm -hmm. with us. Well, now thank you for your beautiful participation. We're really glad you could join us today as well. Thank you to everyone who tuned in and we'll hope to see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you so much.